Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, October the 18th. Let me introduce you to this week's insider panel. Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward. David Kopel, research director with the Independence Institute. Jesse Paul, reporter and editor at the Colorado Sun. And Ian Thomas DeFoya, a community leader and former candidate for mayor of Denver. All right, we have our ballots here in Colorado. Early in-person voting begins this coming Monday. This is go time for the campaigns, for the election offices, and unfortunately, Patty, also for the rhetoric, which is intensifying even more than it has been this season. Well, at this time last week, I was at the Trump rally where Jesse was also. The, our ballots were going out in the mail, but we were locked up at the Gaylord uh, Resort of the Rockies. It was a fascinating <coughs> event to watch it in person. I know, I, Jesse, it was, what, your fourth rally, a Trump rally, but... If you'd never gone to a Trump rally before, the dynamics were interesting. The volunteers were incredibly nice, who were working early in the day. The people I met at the bar the night before, also very excited and polite. And then you watched the rhetoric go downhill. While Trump is speaking, while he is talking about the Venezuelans who should be killed, you know, de automatic death penalty if they commit murder, um, everybody should be deported, Operation Aurora is going to be one of the first things he does on day one when he's reelected, and he was chastising the media, CBS, New York Times, and as he's doing that, the crowd around the media corral was getting a little upset and was saying, tell the truth. Your time's coming, so I'd like to say we are telling the truth as best we can tonight. Reliable elections are aided by watchdogs who point out potential problems. And uh, former gubernatorial candidate Heidi Ganahl, who now runs a, a media site called Rocky Mountain Voice, has done a good job on that and, and pointing out three potential problems in, in elections. One is election computers should never be connected to the internet because of the possibility of outside hacking. And she came up with the purchase orders from Douglas County showing they bought machines that had Wi-Fi cards in them. As if you still have the physical hardware in there, then a sophisticated person can get into a computer even if the Wi-Fi software uh, has been removed as long as the hardware is still there. Second, there's the issue of undeliverable ballots. The county clerk mails out ballots, and some of them come back because there's no such person at this address. And we know how many of those the post office does because they charge the county clerk to return the mail. But there's a huge discrepancy about how many, in some counties, you know, amounting to thousands, of how many returned ballots they get charged for versus how many people they say we have a list of people that we've removed and taken care of. And so that means that in the next election, you could have another ballot mailed to that same non-existent person at that former address, and whoever lives there now could then swipe that ballot and falsely put it in and, and cast a ballot for somebody else. And then the third problem she pointed out is at the ballot drop boxes. Uh, they are supposed to be secured by video surveillance, but as she points out, a lot of them have cameras that are aimed very badly, so if someone's ballot stuffing by dropping off 100 ballots personally, which is illegal in Colorado, there's no way to actually physically see if that's happening. I was, I was going to talk about something else, but I do want to address all three points there because the, the stuff that Heidi Ganahl has been talking about has been creating some uh, concern among people that is not warranted. So on, on the first part and the Wi-Fi access, there were a dozen counties, some older machines that folks did have that came with the Wi-Fi cards in them. But there are three different checks that folks do to make sure that the connectivity isn't there, both in state rule and uh, things that the clerks have to do um, just before the election gets going to begin with. But on the second point, so county clerks' offices, which are responsible for elections, send out tons of mail to people because they're in charge of DMV and all kinds of other recor recording devices. And some folks have seized on the fact that there is a lot of return mail that comes back that maybe, uh, that including ballots, and then they conflated that with the other return mail to say that there were more ballots being returned uh, when reality, you know, it was other pieces of mail that were coming back to the post office. And, and the way that they uh, managed that is actually by a per cost basis, not by individual mail. So for instance, if I send you three pieces of mail and they all come back, 
it's a three-piece uh, charge that comes back, but you, it's not three ballots. So people were misinterpreting that information. And then on the third point, I'll just point out that you know I, I haven't seen every uh, surveillance camera that's pointed at a ballot box across the state, but I will point out that at least in a few different cases, clerks' offices have had the ballot, the, the cameras pointed in the right direction, and they've used the video surveillance at, uh, from those to prosecute people who have, have tampered with ballot boxes. So the, the clerks are quite frustrated by the stuff that Ms. Canal is bringing up and, and trying to kind of combat you know, the, the, this fear that she's stirring. I really don't understand uh, why we continue to give credence to it. When, and when Heidi was upset that it didn't get news coverage, I can see why. Why would we cover something that is going to continue to undermine our elections? You heard all the reasons here from Jesse why it's important. I see you have a giant blue book over there, and I want to encourage every single person to take the time. Democracy requires people to put in the time. Most of the time, you pick people to do the work. You know, A couple times a year, you have the opportunity to do it yourself. I hope people, maybe they can carve out some time while they're carving pumpkins. There's an opportunity for them to you know, get involved in democracy. Uh, I, I do want to say that you know, active voter suppression is real all across this country. I think we collectively need to push back on that to have fair and safe elections. And you know, lastly, I just want to plug this one again, because I've said it before, and I've talked to uh, Paul Lopez, the clerk of Denver, about this. Like, Why don't we light up the city for voting like we do for the Broncos? Why don't we buy banners and hang them? There are more signs sometimes for an engineering conference than there is for voting. And I think we can invest in that kind of infrastructure to get people excited about voting and to remind them that they have the opportunity. I think that would be a great idea. Do you know what I do every year for Halloween is I, I carve vote into my pumpkin. Oh. So that I try and we get like 200 trick-or-treaters, so. Yeah, but most of them are not eligible to vote. That's true, that's but, true. Well, they are if you're Heidi. Their parents. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. Does Heidi think that her the election was stolen from her when she ran against Jared Polis? Does she, she oh, think there were, there were mistakes or conscious moves so that she would lose? Oh, I have no idea, but that would certainly be implausible because his margin of victory was so large that whatever irregularities might have occurred, couldn't couldn't have affected well, that. Well, two hundred trick or treaters from Jesse's could do yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. I bet you get a lot of Democrat tech trick or treaters. <laughs> In my neighborhood, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Since early August, we have discussed a different ballot measure every week, uh, right up so we are well informed for Election Day. And we've talked about, of the seven proposed amendments to our state constitution, we've talked about four. And as you've probably opened your envelope, you can see there are a lot of measures that we have to have a feeling of what's going on before we can make our decision. David, let's start with you about one of the constitutional mm -hmm. amendments. Sure. So there, <clears throat> there's currently a... Uh, Commission on Judicial Discipline. Uh, ballot Measure H, uh, uh, Amendment H, would, would add to the Constitution so a layer on, on top of that to supplement is something called the Di Judicial Discipline Adjudicative Board. It would be four state district judges, four attorneys, and four lay people appointed by the Supreme Court or the governor and then confirmed by the Senate. But my concern on this is People are saying the, the Commission on Judicial Performance, which is also appointed by the governor and the Supreme Court, is not doing a good job. So if you have those same people appointing another board, why do you think that they're suddenly going to start appointing better people than they have been before uh, to this commission that, that is uh, criticized? Isn't the idea to make this um, judicial investigations more transparent for the public to know? Yes, and the, the critics of that would say that that's fine and, and that that's a good thing in itself. H would improve transparency. I'm not, I'm not sure it's guaranteed to improve decision making. Amendment J is another one of the 14 statewide ballot measures. It would remove language in the state constitution that prohibits same-sex marriage. Obviously, that's legal. The U.S. Supreme Court went ahead and ruled on that in the past, but uh, the legislature referred this to the ballot in order to just clean up this language and make sure that uh, even if there is some kind of change in the U.S. Supreme Court, if a new ruling comes down, that uh, same-sex marriage would still be legal in Colorado. And so we're seeing a decent amount of money spent on behalf of that. There's not really any opposition to it. And unlike other uh, constitutional amendments on the ballot this year, this one just needs a simple majority to pass because it's actually stripping language. So it, 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 should, be, it should make it through. This first one that we were talking about, H, with the uh, transparency, I mean, we've seen ethics complaints all the way up to the Supreme Court. I think this is a hot-button issue for people. And I'm not even sure 
that ethics complaints always lead to what you hope comes in the outcome. I've seen plenty at the city council level where it's like, yeah, you shouldn't have done that, but we don't really have much authority to do something about it. Often goes to the ballot box. But I am in favor of more transparent conversations about holding people who held the power to really impact people's lives uh, to be more transparent and to be open to the public. So I'm a supportive of that, of course. G, uh, the property tax exemptions or reductions for vets with disabilities. I mean, I think that's like a no brainer uh, for people. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to say I, I really can, can't stress enough how important it is to read your blue book. And I do want to point out that in Denver, I had to request a second. Uh, you have to request it or go online to get all of the pieces for the ballot issues. So I want to be clear like, if you're in Denver and you pick that up, you know, you don't have to go online to get the pros and the cons on things that aren't related to taxes. And I think that's really important. I want to encourage people to look at RTD, Denver Health, the Denver Public Schools Bond. Yeah. Patty. To go back to the judges, this is, this is the one I hear the most about when I'm talking on panels. People want to know more about judges. They're very concerned that things are going on behind closed doors, which, of course, they are. And if you follow David Magoya's unbelievable series about a year or two ago for the Denver Gazette, we saw exactly what kind of shenanigans were going on with the Colorado Supreme Court with certain contracts being given to disgruntled employees to shut them up. And that was definitely information we needed to know. Whether or not this new panel would punish them appropriately, at least the public would know what was going on. And in fact, maybe it wouldn't go on at all if there actually is this system in place to keep an eye on judges. So I'm not sure it's perfect, but it's better than what we have. And I would certainly encourage a yes vote on that. And people who need to find out about the judges, you can go in the blue book, you can find out some ratings, you can dig further online. Okay. And if you go to pbs12.org, you can, in our election page, you will see a list of previous discussions that we have had about some of the various uh, ballot measures going back into August. So we have now 10 different discussions for you to check out as you use this weekend to carve your pumpkins and stay inside with the rain and fill out your ballots. All right. This week, the Aurora City Council voted to move ahead with an investigation into Council Member Danielle Jarinski's claim that the state of Colorado and the city of Denver moved migrants into Aurora without the city knowing. Jesse, let's start with you. This is something that she said at that Trump rally last week as well. Yeah, she was one of the speakers at the rally. I'll, I'll say that the state has vehemently pointed out that this isn't true, that it gave money to nonprofits and let them kind of handle it. So I guess you could make an argument that by proxy, you know, they were distributing money, but oftentimes, uh, you know, immigrants will move to a place where the rent is cheap, and so uh, Aurora is, is a lesser expensive option in the Denver metro area, as, as people know. I, I think just one thing to point out here is that before the Trump rally was announced, before it happened, the kind of rhetoric and discussion about Aurora and what was going on there had kind of died down. And the mayor, Mayor Mike Kaufman, said, look, we've handled the situation. We feel confident about where things are at. But both Trump's rally and now this investigation that Ms. Jarinsky is asking for is putting that spotlight back on Aurora and, and I think, not in a very positive light. And, and I think there's going to be lasting consequences for the city as a result. And by having this investigation uh, kind of a hunch looking for something um, is, is problematic for the future of the city and it's just going to kind of keep this conversation going where, whereas, you know, folks have said, look, here's the truth, it's settled. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what the next chapter is, but I guess we're going to keep talking about this. Okay. Ian? Well, this whole conversation has been just really troubling to my family personally. You know, my fiance being Venezuelan who migrated here, granted, uh, you know, more than 15 years ago. But we're connected to this community, and I think the vitriol is extreme. I think we're starting to see, and this happened in the 90s, where you have people who are multi-generation, Mexican-American, or even immigrants from Mexico who are starting to have conflicts within our own communities and our own culture. I think we need to really take a look at ourselves and say that that's not how we get ahead. I feel like investigations being trumped up, like they have some sort of like subpoena power and they're gonna drag all these people in there for hearings. I mean, at the end of the day, I think both the state and other communities across the country and communities within Colorado, we're all trying to coordinate to make sure that human rights were given to people who are immigrating here, who showed up here with nothing because of uncoordinated effort and broken federal immigration laws. Meanwhile, the same party that she's supporting kills the bill that would have stopped 
some of the problems that are coming to our communities that are uncoordinated. And so I just, all the way around, I feel like it's just another way to put it into the media cycle that I don't think is gonna lead to anything better. And I would agree with Jesse. I mean, it's more affordable to live in Commerce City or in that part of Aurora than it is in Denver. And so when people come into Denver and then they get the opportunity to look for housing and where it's available, I, I think that's also connected to it. Hmm. Patty. Well, Jarinsky didn't just push this resolution. She also hinted very broadly at the fact that she had a video that is going to blow the, the lid off everything. And when she already was involved with the other video and Cindy Romero, the woman who had moved out of one of the CBZ um, apartment complexes, had a video, which spoke at the Trump rally too. And so if she's got this video, why doesn't she give it to law enforcement? She wants a call from Jared Polis instead. I think the governor took the right approach to say he, he told law enforcement authorities, talk to Jarinsky about this video, because if it's really something illegal, they're the ones who should handle it. So between that and the resolution that the city manager is supposed to go investigate, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to see anything very useful. What we are seeing is the nonprofits that have been working with immigrants in Aurora, not for a year, not for two years, for decades. You know, there are 130 different countries represented in Aurora with the immigrants. Those people are actually afraid for what's going to happen. So this table I has just moments ago been very in favor of transparency. So the resolution that the Aurora City Council passed is not for the city manager to put on his Sherlock Holmes hat and uh, get a magnifying glass and go around investigating for clues. It's simply a direction that the Aurora City government make a request under the Colorado Open Records Act to the governor's office, the Denver mayor's office, and things like that about their communications with nonprofits on this on the particular question of encouraging uh, immigrants to move to Aurora. Uh, Councilwoman Jarinsky has also said that one of these organizations, the East Colfax Community Collective, she's called them communist, and then she would, uh, but when she was asked to back it up, really couldn't, and I, I looked into it. The communist claim comes from tweets by someone who's a reporter for a group called Turning Point USA. Uh, her name is Savannah Hernandez, and although she used the word communist in her tweets to describe the East Colfax Community Collective, she didn't describe any, provide any, any backup on that. And since communism is, for all practical purposes, the same thing as Nazism, people shouldn't throw out accusations uh, about people being communist without good evidence. Uh, Denver is considering granting up to $9 million in tax breaks for a new uh, data center in the Elyria Swansea neighborhood. And while CoreSight would provide computing services to companies throughout the metro area and beyond, uh, there are a lot of environmental questions, Lamine, um, especially considering that the center's daily water usage would be the equivalent to what 16,000 people would use in a single day. Ian, let's start off with you on this. Yeah, this one's a complicated one. and economic development and how it interrelates with environment and impact to communities, I think is on the cutting edge of environmental justice. In particular, as you're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and other resources that are pouring in to build battery factories in residential neighborhoods in Brighton, uh, or in this example, to bring a data center to a former cement site, to be quite frank. This is where industrial zoning and heavy commercial zoning is. And because of growth of our society, we are continuing to encroach into this mixed use development that puts people in harm's way. So are we going to have a conversation about down zoning and changing and creating buffers to like protect communities? Are we going to use these economic development incentives to get better community benefits agreements? I think that Councilman Darrell Watson's been trying to have this conversation. You know, the water part is concerning. Also, where is it getting in its energy? They, they have to be cooled. Why don't we build them where it's, needs, where it's cooler and you don't have to spend as much energy as the conversation some people are having? I think you're, this won't be the last we hear about it, this one site. I think it's gonna continue to come up. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the state legislature in the coming years. Really, okay, Patty. You also saw yesterday, or Wednesday, it was, for example, Cronkey held a community gathering to talk about what they would bring to the community if they do that huge ball arena development. Mm -hmm. So they were much more proactive than Corsite was in this one. But 
you think about it, we've talked about the slaughterhouse, their jobs, that are, but is, do they balance the environmental issues, which Tyrone brought up last week. In this case, the environmental issues are huge. You want jobs, but is this the way you want to bring them into this area? And on top of it, do you want the city of Denver to give them those kinds of incentives? So I think there's going to be a lot more discussion of this. Okay. Well, in, in my view, the concern about water is uh, somewhat pretextual and overblown. You can't create a data center in Gillette, Wyoming, uh, where it is colder than here, uh, to serve Denver because you'll spend a lot more money and energy to transmit things back and forth. But I agree that the, the core problem is the core site business getting a 50% tax cut up to $9 million on its sales and use taxes related to the, the construction of the site. The Colorado Constitution specifically outlaws this kinds of thing. It says, the power to tax corporations and corporate property, real and personal, shall never be relinquished or suspended. And the Colorado Constitution is 100% clear, but the Colorado Supreme Court is equally 100% clear that they blow off and have nullified every single protection in our Constitution against special corporate welfare deals for particular big businesses. Okay, thank you. I think it's just an interesting time to be uh, a business in Denver. The, the business environment's fascinating, right? I think uh, companies like this are going to be watching closely to see what happens with Ordinance 309 with the uh, slaughterhouse ban in the city. And if voters decide, hey, we don't like this because of the environmental reasons, um, we're kicking out this, the slaughterhouse, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm a data, data, center owner, data center owner if I'm going to invest in the Mile High City. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's talk about some of the highs and the lows from this week. Let's start with the negatives. We can end on a high note, Patty. Let's start with something negative. Ian referred to something that I think is disappointing. I like it that the Denver election office wanted to save money, and so they only put some things, the ones they legally had to that involved taxation. Those ballot measures are in the blue book that's mailed to everyone. But they did not include all the other measures. You've got to go online or request to get that information. It is hard enough when you've got that big blue book or white book or whatever colors Denver is in front of you to make your choices. You've got to make it easier for voters. They shouldn't have to go chase information through the Internet when they're already mailing it. 60 Minutes uh, in the past couple of weeks has deceptively edited two interviews, one with Kamala Harris where she was asked a question about Israel, did this like three minute word salad that, that said nothing and was incoherent. And so when they broadcast it, they switched, switched out that answer and put in her answer to another question where she seemed more coherent. And then conversely, when House Speaker uh, Johnson was interviewed, he was asked a question, answered it, and they edited out his answer and put in something else unrelated to make it look like he hadn't been able to answer. We will not do this to you here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I can do stupid <laughs> things on my own without any help from editing. All right, Jesse. I just the the vitriol that we experienced at the Trump rally, uh, some of the aftermath, and then following a, a story I did about the eighth congressional district race this week has just really been disappointing. And I just want to say, you know, I don't know when it became okay to to threaten people and say awful things and not accept the truth, but I just wish we could maybe turn down the temperature, think before you speak. Mm -hmm. You know, mine has to do with the CD8 debate, which I was rather disappointed that Nine News didn't ask a question about the environment. When you consider agricultural production huge, oil and gas and the encroachment on people, the air quality and non-attainment, you have Suncor and 189 businesses violating federal law openly on the ECHO database from EPA, all in CD8. And for that question not to come up, I think was just really lacking. Okay, something good. Community celebrations this weekend, the Broadway Halloween parade that almost was canceled because costs went up so high, the community stepped forward, gave the money you, they needed for security, so that will go on on Saturday. And the zombie crawl is back. Mm. It's not crawling on the 16th Street Mall because that's really at a crawl. It's going to Larimer Square, but the zombie crawl is back. Fun. All right, David. Our Colorado congressional candidates in, in almost every district, if you look at the Republican and the Democrat, like Denver, incumbent Diana again against challenger Vladimir Archuleta, you can look at both of them and say that both are actually much more qualified intellectually and morally to be president of the United States than the current pair we've got running, a pair of, of narcissistic grifters uh, who have no respect for the Constitution. 
we're starting to get a lot of interactive interactivity with the ballot measure explainers we did this year. So I'm really excited to see Colorado voters taking the time to do research on the statewide ballot measure since there's so many of them. And encourage folks, if, if you read your blue book, but come visit coloradosun.com. We've got a great voter guide there to help you understand what's on your ballot. Colorado Sun does have a very thorough guide. Thank you for that. I wish I had time to go to the zombie crawl. I always went as a survivor when I was younger. I hope that, man, I can't run as fast as when I was younger, but I always <laughs> thought I'd make it. But you know, for my day job, I run a nonprofit, Green Latinos Colorado, and we're celebrating five years this Saturday. We're having a summit bringing together people and speakers about the IRA from the Department of Energy, Health and Human Services, and the EPA. Uh, we're gonna have a daytime party. It's at Revision with the DJ and Booth's Eco Fiesta, and then at night we're having a band. I'm really excited to, to be celebrating with everybody. Everybody. Technically, we hit five years in May, but we're finally getting to the party because of session. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm still at a high from a lightning conversation with some of our state's top election administration experts regarding the uh, security of our election process. And we are, we're recording. So if you have any questions or you have any assumptions about what is going to be the most scrutinized election in our time, I encourage you to tune in. First, this Thursday night, October the 24th, for at 8 o'clock for a look at this half-hour discussion. Of course, we'll be streaming it as well. Uh, we have our podcasts on YouTube and Spotify. So listen to what the clerk and recorders are saying, election law officials are saying. It's really, really great information. Thank you, insiders, for joining us this week. We appreciate you. Thank you for watching at home or listening to the podcast. I am Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week here on PBS 12. PBS 12 believes in the power of original, local programming. Help us bring more shows, like the one you just watched, by donating at pbs12.org slash program support today.